Let's share some of our best stuff, like yeah. stuff that like, we don't normally share. <laughs> yeah, stuff that we either the stuff that we don't normally share or stuff we don't share with people unless they pay us a whole lot of money. Um, or just stuff that will really move the needle a lot. I think the best thing that will serve everybody here is we share stuff that really moves the needle a lot. My desire for y'all is I really, really desire for each and every one of you to understand how much impact you can make just by owning your assignment. Just, just, just own it. Like, don't stick your toe in the water. Don't play with it. People ask me all the time. In fact, I remember one time I asked you this. But people ask me this all the time. Myron, if you could go back and do your entrepreneurial journey over, what would you do differently? Myron, if you could, at 62, year old, 62 years old, go back and talk to your 18-year-old self, what would you say? My answer is always the same. Y'all know what it is, don't you? Get it done faster. I wouldn't have taken so long. I wouldn't have waited to get ready to get ready to prepare to prepare to like make my financial life work. I wouldn't have done that. I would have gotten it done so much faster because the sooner you get it done, the longer you get to enjoy it with the people you love the most. Do not make the mistake of forgetting that you are expiring. People sometimes, man, why are you so intense? Because I'm dying and I know it. Like, quit tripping. Stop acting like you're going to live to be 972. I'm going to get to it one day. And then one day turns into none day. Because you keep putting it off and keep putting it off and keep putting it on. Like, get the deal done and quit tripping. It doesn't take you a long time to go build a successful business. It takes you a long time to become the person who's willing to do it. But it doesn't have to take a long time to become so, if I could share a principle with y'all that's one of the most important principles that you could learn, and I'm not, probably something I'm not going to teach this week, I don't think, at least I don't have any intention of teaching it this week. Not that I sit down and map out all my talks to the nth degree, that's not my jam. My jam. That's his jam. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, people have invited me to come speak, and say, what are you going to talk about? I don't know yet. I need to go see the people. I need to pick up on the energy. I need to feel like what the jam is, what the vibe is. I, like, I know a whole bunch of stuff, but I don't know what these people need until I see them. Anybody in here like that or is it just me? Okay, there's a couple of us, cool. And, and a good friend of mine, Kenny Grant, told me one time, he said, man, I'm gonna tell you something. He said, a prepared man's better than a prepared message. So I just make sure that I'm a really, really diligent student of all the stuff I learn, and I go implement it before I start talking about it. So what I'm gonna share with y'all is I'm gonna share with y'all the myth of the economic pie. When you, understand, when you understand that the economic pie theory is a myth, then you can stop feeling like you need to compete with everybody. You can stop feeling guilty for all the money that you make. You can stop trying to justify the fact that you're rich to people who think money is evil. I don't want to make too much money because I'm not that greedy. I want to leave enough for somebody else. That's all part of the economic pie myth. So, when God created man, there's no such thing as an economic pie. It's a, it's a farce. It's a fairy tale. How do I know that? Well, if a if a if there was such a thing as an economic pie, when God made man, he would have put him in a bakery. He wouldn't have put him in a garden. Did, did I say that too fast? I think I did. Because some of y'all look like, he, he, what, he, he what? God would have put man in a bakery where consumption creates lack. But he didn't put him in a bakery. He put him in a garden. Why did he put him in a garden? Because in a garden, consumption creates production. What does that mean? What it means is, you plant a seed. You know, I got to do my whole whiteboard thing. So, you got, you got this ground. 
you take the seed, you plant it in the ground. Now, the interesting thing about a seed in the ground is it has to go down before it can go up, just like everything else in nature. The law of advancement states that in nature, before anything can go up, it has to go down. And so when the seed says, I want to be a tree, I want to be a tree, I want to be a tree. And no, I'm not going to do the eagle story, so don't get excited. <laughs> um, well, if you want to be a tree, you've got to go down before you can go up. It has to go down in the ground. It has to do all this stuff. What does it have to do when it goes down in the ground? Before it can become a tree, it needs to be, without giving the story away if you heard me talk about it before. What does it have to do? Spread. Grow roots. What else? What is that? Germinate. What else? Good stuff. Good stuff. What's that? Get nutrients. Good. Okay. So it has to do all of those things. What did you say? It has to cease to be a seed. If you are unwilling to stop being what you've been being, you can never become all that you desire to be. You've got to let go of what you've been being, or you will never become all that you can be. So it goes down in the ground. And then what's really interesting about trees, you know, we see this part of the tree. But what we don't see is there's as much stuff going down, going on under the ground as there is up, in the, up above the ground. See, trees don't grow in one direction. They grow in two directions. Trees grow gravitropically, which means they grow away from light and towards gravity. But they also grow phototropically. And the phototropic nature of a tree is that it grows away from gravity and towards light. Hmm, that's pretty cool. It's the gravitropic nature of the tree that makes the phototropic nature of the tree possible. In entrepreneurship, Everybody wants the phototropic nature of the entrepreneurial tree. They want to be in the light. They want their leaves blowing in the wind. They want everybody to see how green they are. But if you don't have deep roots, you'll never be a tall tree. Okay, that's cool. Then they grow some fruit. Let's call those apples. The interesting thing about an apple is this. It has seeds inside it. Y'all remember what Warren Wiersbe said, don't you? He said, any fool can count the number of seeds in an apple, but only God can count the number of apples in a seed. If you were in a bakery and there was a pie and you ate a piece of pie, there would be less pie for everybody else. But if you are in a garden and you eat an apple from an apple tree in an apple orchard in a garden, you expose the seeds. You plant those seeds in the ground, and your consumption created the production of six more trees. That's why the economic pie is a myth. Because in God's ideal environment for man, men and women, Consumption creates production. By the way, we see it all the time, we just don't notice it. Anybody here have, anybody in here have an iPhone? Anybody here have apps on their iPhone? Could you have the apps if you didn't have the iPhone? <laughs> like consuming, buying an iPhone, created the production of iPhone apps, and cases, and pop sockets, and on and on and on, and screen protectors, and repair, and on and on and on and on and on and on and on, the story goes. So, this whole idea that somehow entrepreneurship takes away from our society and from our environment and destroys the environment and blah, 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 and all the rest of that gobbledygook that people want you to believe so they can control you, it's a farce. Don't buy the lie, it costs too much. Don't be ashamed of what you produce. I don't have to, I don't, like when I, give when I give money to charity, I'm not giving back. I'm just giving, there's no back. I didn't take anything from the charity I give it, I'm giving it to. I don't need to justify the money I make by calling it giving back. How many of y'all picking up what I'm putting down? Wave at me, my babies. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Now, here's what's really interesting. While we're talking about a garden, 
Not only is God's ideal environment for a garden, but because all principles are microcosms of each other, whether you know it or not, you are a garden. Your mind is a garden. You sow seeds in your mind, and it produces fruit. Ideas that can produce whatever else you want it to produce. But what's really fascinating to me is God planted a garden in Eden, and then he put the man there. And the man's job was to cultivate and protect the garden. That's pretty cool. But when God made man, men and women, because he called their name Adam, and Adam means man, when he called their name Adam, so when God made man, put him in the Garden of Eden, here's what happened. God made man from the, talk to me, dust of the ground. Oh. So the ground that grows our food is the same ground that we were made from. That's pretty cool. Well, here's what else is interesting about that. God planted the seed of an aspect of his creativity inside of all of us. He did not plant the aspect of, he did not plant all of the aspects of his creativity inside of any of us. Do you know why? Because if he planted an aspect of his creativity inside of each of us, then each of us needs all of us, and all of us needs each of us. I don't have any competition. I only have collaboration. Even people who think they're my competition. We don't have competition because we're all made for a totally different purpose. Russell's not my competition. Keen is not my competition. I don't have any competition. The only person who can be Myron Golden in this season, I mean, there are other people with that name, but I'm talking about this Myron Golden, this assignment is me, in the history of the whole wide world. I don't have to beat anybody to win. Wow. How cool is that? Well, here's what happened. God planted an aspect of the seed of his creativity inside of all of us. People wonder, why do you talk about the Bible all the time? Why do you talk about the Bible all the time? Why do you talk about the Bible all the time? It's life. It's life. So, watch this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote some verses for you to show you, tie the whole thing together, and I'm going to turn it over to Russell. It says in Isaiah chapter 55, my ways are not your ways, saith the Lord, neither are my thoughts your thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts and your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven. What does the rain do? And the snow do? It comes down from heaven. And it watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth in bud. The rain and the snow come down from heaven and water the earth to make it bring forth in bud, which means the earth doesn't have any choice once it gets watered. Maketh it bring forth in bud, why? That it may give bread to the eater and seed to the sower. The water comes down from heaven to make the, the earth bring forth fruit so that it can give consumption to the consumer and production to the producer. That's what it said. Watch this. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. And it shall accomplish that which I please. And it, my word, shall accomplish shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. What does all that mean? Here's what it means. Here's what I see happening. God, by the way, all principles are microcosms of each other. So this whole idea of a garden is bigger than we know. This whole idea of a tree, the whole idea of Solomon talking about trees is bigger than just Solomon talking about trees. When I water the dust of the ground that is me, with the water of the word of God that came down from heaven. It saturates the soil that is me so that the seed of creativity that God planted inside of me can bring forth and bud and give food to the eater, bread to the eater, and seed to the sower, consumption to the consumer, and production to the producer. Even for those of you who don't even know the Bible or like the Bible or don't even believe the Bible, the best thing that I can do for you is teach you principles of truth from that book, even if you don't like it. Because whether you know it or not, that is your best chance to win. So that's why the concept of the economic pie is a farce. 
Because God's ideal environment for man is not a bakery, but a garden. So much so that he made you a garden of creativity to create ideas that feed and serve other people and profit you so everybody's blessed by everybody else. God put us all in the world by ourselves. He put none of us in the world for ourselves. Russell? Can you imagine following that up with anything? <laughs> Come on, man. Holy cow, that was amazing. <laughs> like, that was awesome. Um, okay, well. <laughs> All right, so, so <laughs> I say uh, on the on the on the yacht, I was talking to Anissa, and she was saying that we're both her mentors. She said that from you, she learns like belief and this kind of stuff, and for me, it's more tactical. So I'm gonna go tactical because cool. That's, we're that, tag teaming, bro. We're that tag was teaming. amazing. Anyway, so um, I don't know how to like transition other than I got something cool I want to share. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's that cool, but. Um, so I was thinking about, well, uh, Myron gave a sermon that was amazing. <laughs> I, could just listen, I could just listen to talk forever. Like, it's insane. Like, that just came out of your head. And just, that was amazing. <laughs> anyway, that was amazing. So I'm, I'm, six, I'm 62, and I've been thinking about this stuff since I was 16, bro. It ain't that deep. Okay, well, I'm going to try to one-up it, but I'm not. Anyway. <laughs> so what I was going to talk about is, um, so my thoughts in my head, um, a lot of recent, I don't know about if you guys are like me, but I'm thinking about marketing and sales and like that stuff all the time. Partially for me and my companies, but also because um, obviously I lead a lot of entrepreneurs and so like I'm always trying to like protect myself but protect everybody else as well, right? If you've read the Traffic Secrets book, like the intro, the introduction says, warning, there's a storm coming, right? And then right after that, COVID hit, and then right after that, we have the Apple, Facebook fights and ad costs 3X and then like just all sorts of chaos happened since then. And it's interesting to me because um, so many people I know and love, their businesses went away during this season, right? Because they couldn't mm. handle it and add costs and things like that. And it's interesting because I talk about, in, in the book I talk about all the things, but everyone always still defaults back to like Facebook ads or like just the, the basics, right? And the whole, the whole goal of that book initially was like to, to be a warning, but also to get people thinking differently as opposed to like, um, because I, I got started in this game, uh, man, 22, 23 years ago now. So if you look at like when I got started, it was pre-Facebook, pre-MySpace, pre-Friendster. You guys remember Friendster? Wow. Like yeah. that's when I got started. So like when people ask me, how did you get traffic back in the day? I'm like, how did we get traffic back in the day? You couldn't just go to Facebook and buy ads. You couldn't, mm. there was Google ads for a little while, but then that went away. There was SEO, but like, but like how did we actually get ads? And like we had to be more strategic way to think differently. Um, one of my f first mentors, and he spoke at last year's Funnel Hacking Live for anyone who's there, uh, is Mark Joyner. And he wrote a really good book on this, but um, Mark was doing, like, he was innovating on this stuff way back in the day, like how do you get traffic, how do you, how do you, how do you create traffic, right? And the, the interesting thing that Mark talked about is that you don't create traffic, like traffic's already there, right? You look at the internet, people are already on websites, they're already doing things. Our job is not to, is to, is not to go and like, create traffic, it's all about like, how do we shift someone's attention from over here to me, right? That's the whole premise. And I think for most people there was a decade where ads, Facebook ads specifically, were cheap and expensive, and so people jumped in and they bought Facebook ads, and it was just like, oh, this is easy. And so a whole generation, a decade worth of, of marketers got really, really lazy because it was easy. And they got a little harder, a little harder, and they got really hard, and that's when people are starting to fall. And so for me, it's always like going back to the, to the, the foundation, back to the, to the roots, right? Um, somebody on the ship asked me like, why I bought Dan Kennedy's company, and a big reason was like, I needed to go back to like the beginning of the, like, like Dan Kennedy had, had, has been through the cycle, like back in the day, infomercials, so like, um, on TV, TV used to play until like 11 o'clock at night and the TV would just end. And so Dan and his buddies were like, nothing's on, TV, nothing's on TV at 11 o'clock to like 4 in the morning. We should go and buy the time from the TV stations. And the TV stations were like, why would you want the time? Everyone's in bed. And like, I think, we think it's going to be good. So they started buying infomercials. And they'd buy like six hours worth of infomercials from like 11 till 5 a.m. for like 30 bucks. The station's like, sure, give us 30 bucks. You can throw it on there. And so they're running infomercials. And they're making millions of dollars. And they're just like, this is crazy. If people knew what we were doing, and they're running these things and they're just like, hmm, right? And they were like, make all this money and for a while it was happening, happening and all of a sudden like, the stations are like, like, what's happening? They start monitoring and checking and all of a sudden they realize what's happening. Like, oh, the sources, these guys are making money with this. So they started increasing the price and they increased the price and more people found out. Competition then boom, now like late night infomercials are some of the most expensive media you can buy now, right? But there was a season when it was 30 bucks for like six hour block, right? 
and then it shifted. That's great. Right? You guys had a decade where Facebook was like two bucks a lead, three bucks a lead, right? Like, it's crazy. Um, and you look at, so I asked Dan, I said, what happened when, when people were doing later infomercials and it shifted? What happened? He's like, 90% of people went out of business, 10% of us figured out how to build deeper funnels, figured out other ways to do it, and like figured out how to make, how to increase how much money we made per customer. Um, and then the same thing happened with direct mail, and the same thing happened with uh, phones and fax machines. Like every media, every media source goes through this cycle where you come in, and at first the costs are really, really low, it creates mass adoption, everyone starts using it, and after they're addicted, it's like drug, the drug dealer closed. After we're addicted, they can increase the ad costs, and it's the, it's the, it's the cycle, right? It happens platform by platform, it happens season by season. Um, and so for me, I was thinking a lot about like, how do we protect ourselves from this? And how do we, how do we um, think about traffic differently? And actually on the boat today, Dr. Nissa Holmes was sharing an idea and then it kind of sparked this in my head because like she got it and she connected to it. And I'm pretty sure that almost everybody else in my community has missed it, but she got it. And she explained, I don't know if she knows that she got it, but, I, but she got it. And so this is, this is the principle. So Mark Joyner wrote his book called Integration Marketing. And what his premise of the, and it's a little short book, you can read it in like an hour, it's a little mini book, you can go to Amazon. Um, but the premise of integration marketing is, is there's already traffic happens, there's already streams of traffic, right? And what we're traditionally taught is like, oh, go and buy an ad. So we go and buy an ad in this thing. Um, or let's say we find someone with an email list. So I go to Myron and I'm like, hey, we promote my, my challenge next week. And you're like, sure, what, how's, you know, we figure out the commissions, he promotes it, and we get a big spike of sales and then it disappears. And next week I'm like, oh, I gotta figure out how to promote this thing. And we, we go through this cycle of trying to figure out how to hustle and how to, how to make these sales, right? And <clears throat> what Mark talks about in this book is, is instead of figuring out like, how do I get Myron to do a one-off promotion? How do I look at, like, how do I integrate into Myron's business, into his marketing, so that anytime he gets a lead, I'm gonna make more money. Anything he does in his business, I make more money. So instead I come to Myron and I'm like, okay, um, you're running your business, I'm running my business. What if, um, when somebody joins your challenge, how many emails do you send them right now? Let's say you got like a 10 email sequence, right? How many emails, right? 10 emails, yeah. Let's say it's 10 emails, I'm like, cool. Okay. So you send 10 emails to them, and then after 10 emails are over, it ends. How about email 11, 12, and 13, you put an offer to my free plus shipping offer, to my free book, whatever, and in exchange, I'll put an email uh, for you in my challenge on, pay, on day 12, 13, 13, 14, right? And now what happens is every time Myron does a new challenge, gets a new lead, mm. something happens, he goes through the cycle, and then it builds my business. And every time I do something, it goes through the cycle, and it builds his business, mm. right? So when I launched ClickFunnels, uh, Mark had just written this book, and I was thinking about it, and, um, and we didn't run Facebook ads for the first two years of ClickFunnels, or any kind of ads, I didn't know how to run ads. I was just, I was an ad guy, I was just like, I was, I was this kind of stuff. And so um, what we started doing in our company, because we didn't have ads, was like, let's do integration with partners. And so what we would do is we'd find somebody who had an email list and we'd do a promotion with them. So we'd, they'd promote a webinar, we'd do the webinar together, we'd make some money on the webinar, and then what was done, what we'd do is we'd take that webinar, we'd build out a funnel, and it became their funnel. I said, this is your funnel, anytime you drive someone here, you get paid commission on it. Like, you already introduced me on the, on the video, we have this whole thing, like, it's an asset now that you've created, let's plug this in so that it's on the footer, like, on your help desk, when your support desk, or answering help desk tickets, in the footer, let's put PS, blah, 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 and push people to the funnel. And they say, okay, sure, we can do that. So we go and we set this up in someone's help desk. Well, now every time somebody comes and asks a question to their help desk, in the PS, there's a link back to my webinar. I set that deal up a decade ago, and those things still make me sales today every single day, right? Because it's in there, like, they don't check, the, like, after you set up, they forget about it, right? Or the email number 11 mm. or 12 you put in there, you never think about it again. And the rest of your life, as long as you're growing your business, it keeps growing my business. Mm. Right? How many places can we start integrating um, into our business? And so we started looking at, at um, as many integration channels as possible. And, like, this comes back to just creativity now. Like you can be as creative as, as, as you can think of, right? And so we start looking at YouTube videos. And so we find people have YouTube videos in our market that are having success. And I go back and I'm like, man, this video's really good. And I look at it and I'm like, they're not promoting anything in the description. So I go to YouTube guy, I'm like, hey, um, how much did it cost to change the description and put a link back to my webinar in here? And I'll pay you 20% or 50% or whatever it is. The guy's like, oh, like, it's just a YouTube video. I recorded it three months ago, I don't even think about it. Like, cool, we add it in there and it's there. And now for the rest of time, that YouTube video is making me, making me money. Right? Mm. If that person makes other YouTube videos. Myron talking about today. He's like, he's making these videos, and as these ones pop over here, all these ones start rising together. So as that guy gets better and better at YouTube, I keep getting more and more sales, more traffic coming through because I'm on the description of this video or this video. I'm in their email sequences. I'm in the, the footer of their, um, uh, of their customer support desk. Um, I started thinking, where else, can I, where else can I start integrating this? We had some partners who um, they ship out like box sets of stuff to all their customers, and they're like my dream customers. So, okay, what if we. What if we put a postcard, and I'll pay for this postcard, I'll put it in every one of the boxes you ship out to somebody, and we'll set up the printer and the shipping house, and let's go there, and every time you ship out a box, my postcard will be in there for my free book offer, or for my webinar offer. And they're like, sure, and we set up once, and I never think about it again, and every time that this person sells a book, I'm getting a customer back on the back end. You see how we start thinking about traffic differently? 
um, instead of having someone just setting up JVs and deals like that, it's like, how do we find integration partners? Have someone literally going out there and finding integration partners. One thing I started realizing was I wasn't very good at SEO, but I knew the value of SEO. Like if you get on page one for work at home or make money or sales funnel, whatever keyword it is, like that's a big deal, right? Um, in fact, this is probably pre click funnels, probably 12, 13 years ago. Um, I found this team, they lived in uh, Peru and they were college, a bunch of college kids in Peru, but they all had peru.edu email addresses and uh, they had access to like their site. So we would, we would do this SEO thing. Anyway, I don't get, I don't want to get nerdy with you guys, but we do this SEO thing where they would trade EDU links and get links. Anyway, um, I wanted to get, I want to be on page one in Google for like work at home, make money online, stuff like that. And so we spent like six months doing it and I got there. And when we hit page number one in Google for like work at home, it was like raining money all day long. It was just mm. like, this is crazy. I'm not paying for this. It was just raining. Um, but there's everyone competing. So we were there for like three or four weeks and we drop back off. We get back up there again, we drop back off. And I eventually I gave up on the game because it was just, it was stressful for me. So instead of I started doing, I'm like, well, who are these guys that keep beating me? These guys are just hardcore, full time, all these SEO. So I go to Google, I type in work at home or make money, whatever my keywords are. And I see like, here's the people. And I see the top three or four people where 90% of the traffic goes to the first three or four listings. So I'd go there. I'm like, that person's getting all this traffic. And most of these guys, the, the really good SEO people aren't info product people like us. They don't know this. They just, mm. they sell advertising. That's what they do. So I come back and I'm like, okay, they're on page one for, Google, for this keyword that's insane. They're probably getting 40, 50,000 visitors a day. I come back and I'm like, hey, um, can I, when somebody opts into the, to the email thing on your form on the thank you page, can I, can I put an offer on your thank you page? Can I put an email in your email sequence? Can I put a pop-up on your page? When someone comes, a pop-up comes up and it joins my newsletter. Mm. I set that up once. I walk away and that thing just starts generating money and leads and traffic forever. And so for me, for the last decade, I've been doing that um, a lot. And most people know about it. Most people see Facebook ads, stuff like that. Those are all great. Um, That's like free money. It's free money. To this day, just so you guys know, like stats, numbers. So a decade of me doing this, if I turn all my ads off right now, we get um, over, over 1,000, probably 1,200 or so people per day who come to ClickFunnels.com and create a free trial that are not, attract, they're not attributed to any kind of paid ads. You can do the math on what that looks like. But it's just this, it's just setting these things up one at a time, one at a time, thinking about it, meeting someone, and not just saying, oh, promote my thing, promote my thing. It's just like, hey, how can I do this? Mm. You know, you find somebody who's got a really good offer that's crushing it, like, what do you have? what's on the thank you page? Like, Grant Cardone did his big challenge the other day, and I knew he was gonna get a thousand people to promote it, so I was like, hey, Grant, on your thank you page, after some register for the challenge, can I put this block down here that tells people to get a free ClickFunnels account? And so he's like, Sure, so we made a video of me and him talking about it. And so on this thank you page, <clears throat> there's like step one, go to the Facebook group, step two, do whatever, step three. And the step four is like me and Grant. And he's like, hey, you should get a ClickFunnels account because Russell said so. And I'm like, yeah, you should get a ClickFunnels account. Here's a free trial. Um, we had like 3,200 3, and something people sign up for free ClickFunnels trial on the thank you page of Grant's launch. I think I made more money from, Grant, more money from Grant's launch than Grant made from Grant's launch. Like, because we plugged it in and all those people started coming in. Now the trials of ClickFunnels, they're getting billed, they go through the value ladder, everything else starts happening. And so it's just thinking about traffic differently, thinking about partnerships differently, thinking about how we can like weave what you're doing in those things. And this was talking about, she created her Mifki offer and she would start looking at who are all the other people in her market that already have her traffic. And she's plugging into their sequences, their thank you pages, all that kind of stuff. Now, every time they get a customer, she's getting a customer. She's got to mm. pay for that. It's just coming through organically. Um, and so that's the first thing to think about. And then the next piece is to kind of add to it. Um, uh, any of you guys here ever studied Jay Abraham? Mm -hmm. Jay's a really right. smart marketer. And one thing he talked about uh, with joint ventures, a lot of times we think about joint ventures, we look at like, um, who's the person, like, who, who's like a, almost like a competitor with us who's got the exact same audience. And what Jay said that was just brilliant to me, so you have to look at like the life cycle of a customer, right? So like, let's say your product is right here. So for me, like, I'm Russell, so I'm, I'm selling funnel software. So a lot of times like, well, who else is selling funnel stuff? Like, let's, let's, that's the JV. But those customers are all in the same spot. And like, what you want to think about is, what are all the things somebody needs before they become your customer and all the things they want they need after they're their customer? Mm. And that's when you start finding new traffic sources that nobody else is tapping into, right? Because I can go after all the funnel people, but now I'm competing with funnel people. If I can stay, step back and be like, well, what does somebody need before they need a funnel? Well, they, they, probably, they probably need a logo. They probably need a website. Maybe they're buying a domain name. Maybe they're buying, maybe they're setting up a WordPress site. Maybe they're, um, uh, you know, getting, they're going 99 designs, they're going to Fiverr. And I started looking like, where are the places that those people are already at prior mm. to them ever coming to me and looking for the integrations options there, right? Uh, like if I could go to, and I haven't closed this deal, but if I could, if I can click 99 designs or um, Fiverr, right? Every time someone goes to Fiverr, if I could be built in their sequence where every time someone creates a Fiverr account the day 22, it's like, hey, you need a ClickFunnels account. Like, can you imagine how much money that would be if I can close that one deal? Like, it takes me three or four or five years to close that one deal, but if I plug that in, that could be, you have 10,000 leads a week coming in 
just from one one integration, one deal. So, do you pay those people an affiliate commission, or they just? It depends. Every every situation is different, um, and every market is different. Like in this, is saying you're paying fifteen percent for your people, right? Is a commission. So it's fifteen percent commission. In the in the funnel world, I got to pay people 50, 60, 70 percent commission because they're they're hot to the game, right? But other places, it's like a lot easier. Sometimes it's like the YouTube guy. It's like yeah, I'll pay hundred bucks to throw out a, a uh, I'll change change your your description uh, or in your description add a link to my thing. They're like, sure, hundred bucks one time, never think about it again. Email sometimes it's just like I've got a whole bunch of funnels. I'm like, okay, Myron, I'll do your day 12 on my free book funnel. You do it on 12 day 12 on your challenge funnel. We will set up. We and you get all the free traffic, get free traffic. We just forget about it. We just say do with um, Tony Robbins and Ingrassiosi. So he owns Mastermind.com, which is a platform for course builders. We own ClickFunnels. So when somebody cancels ClickFunnels right now, um, the only thing I know is they don't like ClickFunnels anymore. But they still want a business, and so um, when someone cancels ClickFunnels, there's a video from me, Dean, and Tony saying, "Hey, sorry that you know ClickFunnels wasn't a good fit for you. Maybe you just weren't ready yet, which is totally understandable. So if you're not ready for ClickFunnels yet, uh, there's another platform that's really simple called Mastermind.com, which is a little easier to get started. And Tony and Dean are gonna lead you, uh, help you. In fact, Tony and Dean jump on here, and they jump on the video, and they're like, "Hey, da da da, we'll give you a free trial." And so then all those people who leave, who are canceling ClickFunnels and leaving, go to Mastermind. I get a affiliate commission to all the people who are leaving ClickFunnels, which is awesome. <laughs> and then when somebody leaves Mastermind. Someone leaves Mastermind, there's a video from me, Dean, and Tony saying, hey, maybe you know we've got a band recorded enough. right, because if the FBI sees this, they're going to arrest you for being a gangster. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that powerful? That's so like, so then, then when someone leaves Mastermind, they come back into ClickFunnels. And think about this, like, when somebody's leaving your website, what do you guys do with the traffic that leaves your website? They just leave it, right? So if I go to Myron, I'm like, how about this? Every time someone leaves your website, put a pop-up on your page. It's like, hey, you should get Russell's free book. And then someone leaves my website, I'll put a page for your book. They don't like my stuff, maybe they like your stuff, right? <laughs> now, it, the traffic is leaving me anyway. I get tra my traffic leaving him, he gets my traffic leaving me, and also we switch traffic and we both start growing together. Mm. So this is the mindset shift I wanted to kind of share to try to compete with Myron's amazing sermon. Um, hopefully give you guys some tactical ideas of just how you can get traffic that's separate from, from all the stuff that we normally think about. See, he just proved there's no competition. It's all collaboration. You just have to look for ways that everybody wins. Stop trying to beat people and start looking to win with people. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dude. That was great, bro. Wow. Now I'm, now I'm dizzy. Now I'm just thinking about all these things I can do. So. Okay, so um, I'm going to share something with y'all. I might share that this week, though. I want to share something I'm not going to share. I'm probably not. I won't share that this week. I'll share it right now. I'll share it right now. I, won't, I, won't, I won't, probably won't share it later this week. And if I do share it later this week, you'll probably get it the second time. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> uh, well, think about it, though. We think that when we're teaching somebody something, that they understand it as soon as we said it. Well, it fell out of my mouth, and it just, they got it. All you need to do to know that ain't true is have some kids. And you will know that just because you said it, that does not mean they heard it. Can I get a witness up in here? <laughs> so so it's, it's, it's amazing. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you all the absolute most mind-blowing, like, aha revelation not about business as much as about life. <clears throat> if you get life right, business is easy. Right? Get life right. Understand how life works. And it's really interesting. You know, I was talking about, I was talking about earlier, <laughs> when I talk about the Bible. In the beginning was the Word. So that's a good place to start, right? Because in the beginning was the Word. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I just, thunk, I just thunk of that just now. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Him was the life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Wow. I just pray that for me and for you, that when the light shows up and shines on the answer that we've been looking for, we are aware enough, alert enough, and care enough to comprehend it.
So, you've probably heard me say this before. You'll probably hear me say it 11,000 more times. God put so many success principles in Genesis chapter 1, it's almost like he gave us a wink and said, if they don't get to chapter 2, I want them to be okay. <laughs> it's like, like I, every, every time I read Genesis chapter 1, how is that in the first chapter in the Bible? So, a couple things. One, the first thing that God tells us about God, why do I, why do I even care about that? Well, when you meet somebody, whatever the first thing they tell you about themselves is, that may not be the most important thing about them, but it's the most important thing they want you to know when you meet them. Are y'all tracking? And God is love. But that ain't the first thing he told me. God is omnipotent, and that's not the first thing he told me. And God is omniscient, and that's not the first thing he told me. And he's omnipresent, and that's not the first thing he told me. And he's righteous, and he's holy, and he's just, and he's good. But none of those things are the first thing that God told me. What's the first thing God tells me about God? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Why did he do that? Now, you may not ask questions like that. But I'm reading that, and I'm like, I mean, you're God. You don't need anything. It's not like you're sitting around thinking, man, I just, just, I don't know. I wish I had a, no, you don't do that. You're God. Why would God create a heaven and the earth? The only answer I've been able to come up with, if you find a better answer, please let me know. But the only answer I've been able to conjure up, and, and I say conjure up, like maybe as a possibility as the reason why he did it, is because he is creative and therefore it is his nature to create. So God's creating flowed out of the fact that he is creative. The first thing God tells us about God is that he's creative. Not because it's the most important thing about him, but because I believe it's the most important thing he desires for us to know about him. Why? Because the first thing that God tells us about us is that he made us in his image. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So if you are a man or you are a woman, God made you in his image. Okay, so now we got that. Why is that important? Well, it's important because if I'm made in his image, and the first thing he tells me about himself is that he's creative, then the first thing he's telling me about me when he tells me he created me in his image is that he created me to create stuff and he made me to make stuff. So now I don't have to go through wandering aimlessly through life thinking, I just don't know what my purpose is. I just need to be my purpose. I don't know my purpose. How do I find my purpose? Your purpose is to live in your creative space and make the world a better place. And see, here's the beauty of it. I don't have to compete with Rod. Because I wasn't created to live in his creative space and make the world a better place. I can't do that. I cannot do his assignment. I can't compete with Michael. I can't compete with AJ. Like, I just, don't, like, I just have to be the best Myron Freddie Golden I can be. And live in the, my creative space and make the world a better place. So when I find in me an inclination to become proficient at something, good at something, I've developed the skill, I can do it. And I can do it well. I can do it at a level of excellence. When I live in that, and then I create something that makes somebody else's life better, I've just made the world a better place. Are y'all tracking? Live in my creative space, make the world a better place. Okay, got that. Locked and loaded. Live in my creative space, make the world a better place. So how do I do that? Is that a good question? I do believe in Genesis chapter 1. We're still in Genesis chapter 1, y'all. I do believe that we find the answer... The first time God ever spoke to a human being. Like, what did he say? This might be fairly important. Here's what he said. First time God ever talked to man, 
and, and, and it's really cool, because here's what it says. It says, and God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. So what, what I get from that is God always gives the capacity before he gives the command. He gives the ability before he gives the assignment. So if I find myself in a space where I feel like this is what I'm supposed to be doing, I don't have to wonder if I can do it. I may not even have the ability, but I have the capacity to gain the ability. So I don't have to wonder if I can do it. If he tells me to do it, I know I can do it because he told me to do it. God's not in the habit of frustrating his children. You don't tell your children to go do stuff that's impossible for them. I don't say to my granddaughter, here, here's the keys to the car. Run down to Publix. Get us some bread and some peanut butter and jelly so we can make some sandwiches. She's three. <laughs> it's not that she'll never be able to do it. She's not yet become the person. So here's what God said. He said, be, oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that in that color. He said, I'm going to do it in that color. I like that. He said, be fruitful. What does it mean to be fruitful? Well, got to go back to Genesis chapter 1 again and find out what is a fruit. A fruit is a living organism whose what? Seed is in itself. Oh, there we are at that seed again. A living organism whose seed is in itself. So when God said to man, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, be fruitful, here's what he's saying. Make sure you produce on the outside of you based on what I put on the inside of you. I put something in you. That was my job. Make it show up on the outside. That's your job. How many of y'all tracking? Be fruitful and multiply. Now, multiply is not a be. You wouldn't say to somebody, well, be multiply. They say, what you talking about, Willis? Where's Willis? Is Willis here? No. Okay, anyway, that was, never mind. Some of you are too young, like, what's he? Never mind. <laughs> be fruitful. The verb for multiply would be do multiply. <laughs> be fruitful. Do multiply. Do replenish. Do subdue. Okay, let's talk about those. Be fruitful. Do multiply. Multiply literally means to increase. The very first thing God told man to do was to increase. Hmm. Be fruitful, do multiply, replenish. Replenish means to fill up. Well, if you start multiplying stuff, stuff's going to start filling up. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue. Now that one's a little odd because subdue literally means to trample, to stomp, to step on, to tread well, if you're telling me to build something up and multiply and fill, I mean, fill something up and multiply, why are you telling me to trample? Because God is introducing us to the principle of entropy. What is that? Disruption always follows intention. Creation is created by intention, and disruption always follows intention. There's no way around it. The mistake most people make is when disruption follows their intention... They make the mistake of assuming that they're going in the wrong direction when it's actually more often a sign that you're going in the right direction. Do you understand, when you start doing something good, the first thing that shows up is something bad. <laughs> I remember when I used to be really fat. I used to be fat myron, now I'm almost fit myron. <laughs> And I said, I'm going to start working out. I'm going to do 30 push-ups. And I got down. Can I do push-ups, Mariah? You good? No, you can't, you can't go that low? Let's try. I'm going to do push-ups. Oh, yeah, we can do it. I'm going to do 30 push-ups. I could do 100 when I was a kid. Man, are you crazy? What in the world possessed you to think? With your fat self. You about to do 30 push-ups. You must be some kind of out your mind. And so I tried to do 30, couldn't do 30. But the next day, I said, okay. The next day, the first day I could do three, the next day I could only do two. This is going in the wrong direction. 
Anybody who's ever worked out knows when you start working out, you don't get stronger first, you get weaker first. When you start working out, you don't feel better first, you feel worse first. How many of y'all ever felt worse first? <laughs> and then eventually one day you're like, I know I'm only going to be able to do four. You're like, oh, I know this is going to get so hard, I don't even know why I keep doing this. Two, three, oh my goodness, where's that going from? Four, oh my goodness, five, oh my goodness, six, oh my goodness, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't stop, I can't stop, I can't stop, I can't stop, I can't stop. And what happens, what happens, y'all thought that was good. Y'all should have seen me before I turned 62. <laughs> Disruption always follows intention. Don't let that deceive you and get you off the, right, off the right track. Don't let the disruption that follows your intention make you feel like you're going in the wrong direction. I bought this building, man. We came in here. The air quality was so bad. Every time I came in here, I felt like I had, like, sand in my eyes. I was in here for an hour. I'd go home. I felt like I had sand in my eyes. So I got to hire ServPro to come in and clean out this, the air ducts. And then we're in the middle of a challenge. We got a torrential downpour. It's December 16th. Last year. We're, we got a torrential downpour. It was raining outside. I'm like, my goodness, what's going on? All of a sudden, it sounds like it's raining in the building. I don't remember a waterfall being in that closet back there. <laughs> We're in the middle. I'm teaching on the challenge. On day four, it's raining in the building. Water starts coming in on flow. Water on the floor about to mess up my clothes. <laughs> anyway, disruption always follows intention. Y'all get it? B, that's why it says subdue. Be fruitful, do multiply, do replenish, do subdue. Increase, fill up, and trample anything that tries to stop you. Okay, y'all tracking. And then it says, have dominion. I'm going to do this faster. Have dominion. So here's the, here's the beauty of it. This is the ultimate success formula in life. Y'all ready? Here it is. Be, do, have. What does that mean? It means don't be, can't do. Can't do, can't have. It means be a little, do a little. Do a little, have a little. It means... Be a lot, do a lot, do a lot, have a lot. Now, here's what's really interesting about this. B, oh, that's good. B speaks to my identity. Boy, when I got this thing, being speaks to my identity. Do you realize that everything you do flows out of who you think you are? Did I say that too fast? Everything you do flows out of who you think you are. See, Russell Brunson, that dude, like he changed my life in a lot of ways, but the most valuable thing he did for me was created an environment where I could be introduced to who I really am. Did y'all hear what I just said? He created an environment that introduced me to who I really am. And so, identity, everything flows out of your identity. Be fruitful, talking about your identity. Do, doing speaks to your activity. Having speaks to your property. So if you will be who you're supposed to be, you'll do what you're supposed to do and then you'll have what See, here's, why, here's where people mess it up. Before I even go there. What's really interesting is God set it up so that we could win. Here's what he said. Here's what God did. He said, I'm going to put inside of human beings this really intense desire to have. See, that desire, you, that desire you have to have a nice house and a nice car and a nice clothes and a nice, nice relationships and pockets full of money and great experiences and nice vacations, that desire that you have, God put that desire in you. Why? so that you would be willing to do the right thing in order to have the things you desire. God cares the most, not about our having, but we care the most about our having. 
So you know, you know what eventually happens? We, we want to have, want to have, want to have, want to have, and finally we yield. I'm going to go ahead and do this thing that will let me have this stuff. That's where, by the way, that's where, that's where all of us in this room started. That's where some of you in this room still are. You're, you're, you're desiring to learn how to do the things that will ca- cause you to have the stuff you desire to have. We're my people. But here's the problem. And if you're taking notes, this is the writer downer of writer downers. You ready? Everybody is already doing 100% of everything they can do who they are right now. I'm going to say that one more time. Some of y'all looked at me funny. (laughs) Everybody, like everybody, everybody. I'm only doing that to keep myself awake, y'all. <laughs> so I'm entertaining me and letting y'all watch, okay? It's way past my bedtime, okay? Okay. <laughs> For those of you watching on YouTube, like, it's a midnight mastermind. I go upstairs at 8.30, start running my bath water so I can be in the bed good and early. And here we are, oh, help me Jesus, at a quarter to 11, and I'm running my mouth. So, <laughs> so, Everybody is already doing 100% of everything they can do who they are right now. So if you desire to do more than you've been doing so you can have more than you've been having, you have to eventually yield to the thing God cares about the most. And that's you got to start becoming who you can be. That's the part God cares the most about. Who are you being while you're doing what you're doing and seeking to have what you're desiring to have? Well... When I get that down, see, like, that's why I'm not going to chase rabbits because I don't have time. In all of us, and I'm going to end on these, this last point. This is not the last point. It's just the last point I'm going to talk about now because I want to hear from Russell. Um, so all of us have inside of us what we call potential. What's potential? It's the difference between in, 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 in our property, our potential is the difference between what we have and what we could have. In our activity, it's the difference between what we do and what we could be doing. In uh, our identity, it's the difference between who we are and who we could be. That's the gap. So what all of us are doing, whether we realize it or not, we're seeking to fill the gap. You are here to fill your gap. You thought you came to fill the gap in your property. But you didn't realize that, that there's a sequence to this thing. and You can't start there. You've got to start by filling the gap in your activity, I mean, in your identity. So what, what is the gap in your identity? Like, this is, this, is like, this is like you're being nothing that you can be. This is like you're being all that you can be. None of us are here. None of us are here. Most of us are somewhere down in here, even if we feel like we're all the way up here. How many of y'all tracking? So you might feel like you're up here, but I got news for you, baby. You're down here. <laughs> oh, my eraser fell out. Oh, there, is that it? No, that's not it. So... I'm going to erase with this thing. Um, so, so you're not up here. But I'm, I ain't messing with you. I ain't up there either. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I ain't tripping. Okay. So how do I fill this gap in my identity? I fill the gap in my identity. I talked about it earlier today. I fill the gap in my identity through intentionality. I become hyper-intentional about everything I am doing and everything that I am being. Thank you. Thank you, Marani. I fill the gap. I fill the gap. And that's how I, I fill the gap with intentionality. I, I start ignoring distractions. And I start hyper-focusing on intention. And this gap starts getting fuller and fuller. It starts filling up. Oh, I'm becoming more than I used to be. I'm becoming more than I used to be. And here's what happens. If you ever do get all the way up here, guess what happens? This just gets bigger. Your potential gets bigger. As you fill the gap, your potential gets bigger. So there's no such thing as filling it up to the full. Because when you fill it up to the full, full gets bigger. Are y'all tracking Okay, in our activity, how do, I become, how do I do more than I've been doing? We fill the gap in our activity. You know, that's none of the things you can do. That's everything you can do. Some of us are, most of us are right down here if we feel like we're higher. So we fill, the, we, fill this, we fill this gap, we fill this identity gap with intentionality. I'm just going to put intent. We fill this gap with ingenuity. Ingenuity. We keep, on, we keep on working a new approach until we find an approach that works like gangbusters. 
We don't get married to anything until it works. People fall, they come up with an idea, they fall in love with it, and they run 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction, attempting to prove an idea works because they came up with it. What happens? Well, the gap in our property, the have part, we fill this with intensity. And I am telling you, when you will become hyper-intentional and like, like just always learning, looking for a new approach, and then become intense, what happens? Everything changes for you. That fell out of my pocket. So that's what I got for you. RB, you good? Yeah. Give it up for RB. We're, we're going to have Russell do one more something, and then we're going to answer three or four questions, and then I'm going to be like Pharaoh and let God's people go. <laughs> I know. Yeah, exactly. Because you you got work to do tomorrow. I do too. Yeah. So and y'all y'all got y'all got some learning to do. I don't want your minds not to be sharp. It's almost eleven o'clock. So do you have something else you'd like to share, or do you want to just go straight into Q and A? What do you want to do? Let's do a Q and A real quick, and then yeah. and then we'll be done. Okay. Yeah. So let's do a Q and A. Who's got a question for Russell? Y'all gonna ask me questions all the time. I'm gonna be here all week. You know, talk to me. Okay, so that was, a, that was a question for me. So his question was, um, if you're like attempting a new approach, how do you know when to stop doing it? I, I think that's going to be different for everybody. So I'll let, I'll let you, I, or I can answer it first and then you answer it, or you can answer it first and I answer it. What do you want to, like, how do you want to do it? Like, how do you know when you've attempted an approach enough times that this has not been working, this is not going to work, I'm done? It's hard because it depends, I mean, I have to watch it to see. Like, some people just, some people try a little bit, ah, oh, it didn't work, and they run away really fast. Some people, though, will like drown themselves holding on to an idea. I've had friends mm. who've done that who just won't let up the thing. And so there's some, there's some version in between. I don't think it's ever like letting go or not letting go. I think it's, it's like lots of little pivots and like tweaks and pivots and changes. Um, but I think it's less of like, does this work or this doesn't work as much as like, um, with anything I'm doing, my goal is I'm putting it on the market. I'm trying to see how the market's responding to something, right? Because um, the market's the ultimate judge. Like, I only care about what people will, like, will you vote on this thing with your credit card? Like, that's the only thing that actually matters in, in anything, right? So what I'm doing in, in, my, in my ideas, I'm putting it out there, testing the thing, and I'm seeing if people vote with the credit card. If they don't, then I'm, okay, something, something was incorrect there, something wasn't quite right, so I'm gonna try another angle, another angle, another angle. And so I'm looking until something hits, right? So it's rarely it's like something works or doesn't work. It's just like, it's being willing to make big enough pivots or shifts around it to see like, like especially if you believe in the thing, right? Like I think a lot of us are, feel like we're called for something, like we're trying to do this thing, but it's like, it's not always gonna be the first time, the second time. Like for me to build ClickFunnels, um, uh, like two years ago or three years ago, I found, found like live, I went through, I found every domain I ever bought, looked at every funnel that had ever actually went live before ClickFunnels, it was 150 funnels I launched before I launched uh, the ClickFunnels funnel. And so, and some of those had some success, some had different, like, you know, compared to ClickFunnels, they were all failures, but every single one of them, like by me attempting and attempting and attempting, it's the thing that made me worthy so that someday God would bless me with the idea for ClickFunnels. And so for me, it's less like, is this working or not? It's just like, it's attacking, 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 and like, and listening and like seeing, you know, where you're led to and trying again, trying again, and over time, it's like, if you keep being persistent, um, that's when, that's when it, it shows up. And, and I think a lot of times people are looking to, um, looking at whether or not the approach worked and then determining that because this approach didn't work that this is necessarily a bad idea. Just because the uh, first, uh, ingenuity is not about changing the objective, it's about changing the method to get to the objective, right? Um, so, and I'm only gonna do, like, people say, well, man, what kind of books do you write? I only wanna, I only write the kind of books people wanna pay to read. I don't only wanna write the books people wanna read, I wanna write the books people wanna pay to read, right? Uh, so I, like Russell said, I let the marketplace determine what objective that I set in business because they're the ones that are going to pay for it, right? It was like I said about Bill Gates earlier, somebody asked me, do you have an iPhone? No, I don't have an iPhone. He had a Zoom, right? But he was the only person in the world that had one, right? I'm, and that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not much, right? <laughs> it, it failed miserably. Why? He created the thing he wanted to create instead of creating the thing the marketplace wanted to buy. Um, so the thing that we need to adjust is the approach. Maybe we may need to adjust the approach a thousand times. And we may only need to adjust adjust the objective one time. And you want to set an objective, like if you're starting out and you're setting your objective by yourself and you think you're right, that what, like the most dangerous, I don't know what you think, but the, one of the most dangerous things you can do is be, to believe that you know what the marketplace wants and be so, I'm gonna make them take this. Not me. I'm gonna find out what they want to take and I'm gonna go make that. Yeah. Right, 
in the marketplace for, for business. Was that, was that helpful, you not? Cool. David, I saw your hand pop up. So his question was, what are some of the most effective, I'm repeating it for YouTube, but for those of you who are wondering. So what are some of the most effective ways for increasing show up rates on webinars? Um, so people's attention spans are this long, right? So the biggest problems people have typically is, especially if they're buying advertising, is they start advertising the webinar way too long. Um, we found that like, if, if, um, if someone registers more than like two and a half days out from the webinar, they're not showing up at all. Right? Even my team, they want like, let's put a webinar a week in advance. Let's start sending emails and all sorts of stuff. And like, the problem is our attention spans are so small. So number one is like, most of my registrations for webinar are happening within 48 hours of the actual webinar. That's number one, right? Mm. Especially email and stuff like that. The further out you send it, it's just like, it's just a waste of, of money because, you know, there, there's that. Number two is just like, again, their attention spans this, this long. So the only thing that actually gets them to the webinar, um, not the only thing, but one of the core things is like the message they get right before the webinar hits. So it's hitting them from any, any angle you can, from text message, email, um, like, because most people are gonna forget unless it's one second before. And then the third and like the most important of all the things is curiosity. Um, the more, like, <clears throat> if someone's registering for webinar and they think they can answer the question of what the promise is on the webinar, then they're likely of showing up to really, really small. When you open such, like, so much like, raw curiosity where they can't figure it out, the only way they can figure out is getting on the webinar, that's when show up rates are the biggest. That's where, like, ah, oh, I have to be there. I gotta, calendar, I gotta schedule my calendar. Um, so we had Mike and AJ in my inner circle. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they had a webinar back in the day, and uh, this was three or four years ago, but they were, it was costing them, like, it was like $35, $40 to get a registrant, which is crazy. And then um, and their show up rate was like 14, 15%. Like, it was really, really bad. And they came to your circle, like, how do we people show up? And the only thing we changed, I was like, if you, if you read their headline, the headline was like, how to, um, how to use local something to increase, or how to use uh, local reviews to, to increase your clients, blah, 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 right? So someone read that, they're like, oh, it's local reviews. I know what local reviews are, I'm a genius. So like, they didn't sign, like, the registration was low, so the ad costs were really, really high, and show up rate was really low as well. So all we did was just change it. I said, don't tell them what it is, tell them what it's not. So they just changed the headline from how to use local reviews to get more blah, 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 to, uh, the new thing we're doing to get more instant result, and it's not, by, and by the way, it's not this or this, or the, and they list off all the things it wasn't, mm. which were all the things that they would think, like, it's not SEO, it's not PPC, it's not this, it's not this, not this, not this, register and we'll tell you what it is. Then it was like curiosity, so what happened is like the conversion on the landing page went up, so when the ad cost went from like whatever, $30, $40, down to like $12 per opt-in, and then the convert, like the show up rate went from like a 12% conversion rate to like a 25% conversion, like just all just raw curiosity. So mm. instead of telling them what the webinar is, tell them what it's not. Like here's the result they want, here's what you're not, what it's not, and like I don't know what it is, like it's not, it's gotta be one of those things, it's not like what could it possibly be? And that's the best thing. So mm. <clears throat> curiosity is number one, um, messages a minute, five minutes before they actually show up in any channel you have access to hit them, and then not advertising too far out where they don't even know who you are by that time. <coughs> My three biggest things. Um, I'm gonna go with Steven, and then I'm gonna come to Andrew, and then I'm gonna go to Steven, and we're gonna be done. I, I put all those guys, I, I saw their hands first, that's why. Steven. So what, what would you say is your biggest uh, strategy for reducing churn when it comes to membership? Because I know maybe a lot of us have membership. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so we've tested a billion things, and of all the billion things we've tested, there are two that, the two that have had the biggest impact consistently across the board in software and just like pure membership sites. Um, both are under one umbrella, and the umbrella is consumption. So we call this operation consumption. How do I get them to actually consume the thing they bought? Back in the day, we used to be like, if we don't say anything, maybe they'll forget, and then like the bill will go through. Right? Causes a bad user experience. It's the opposite. I need to get them to consume. So in ClickFunnels, the biggest thing we did is someone creates a ClickFunnels account. Uh, if they just log in, they hit the members area, and there's all these features and stuff, they sit there and then they don't do, and then they log out and they cancel. Um, so the first thing is I have to get them, I have to like, I have to force feed them, like how do I get you to actually stop for five seconds so, you, so I can show you what this actually is. So what we did in ClickFunnels back eight or nine years ago now, um, is you guys seen the Funnel Hacker t-shirts? Yes. The only way to get a Funnel Hacker t-shirt is to watch us. So if you guys had that, there might be a couple other places you can buy them. But for the most part, someone has to come in and there's a video that says, hey, before you start your ClickFunnels account, um, uh, I want to bribe you because I found that people who, don't, who, who log in ClickFunnels and just start using software, a lot of them drop out because they don't know how to use it. But if they watch a 10-minute video ahead of time showing them how to use it, their success rate's way higher. So I'm going to bribe you. If you watch a 10-minute video, I will give you this shirt for free. Um, so just watch this video. I'll ship the shirt out to you. I'll cover shipping and costs and everything. 
And so then they watch a video where I walk them through it. This is what a funnel is, this is how it works, this is where you click. And then they know what it is and they actually log and then they can consume it. So that's number one. And then the second biggest thing is when someone comes in, we have a consumption sequence where every day they're getting an email and a message that is telling them how to do one thing. And this was my biggest mistake initially. Initially I was like, hey, log in and we're gonna teach you, like, you're gonna log in, you're gonna buy a domain name, you're gonna set this up. Anytime there's an and, killed consumption. Mm. So it's like, log in, go buy your domain name. Tomorrow I'll tell you the next step. So good. Cool, today you're gonna log in, you're gonna pick a template, and the next day I'll tell you the next thing. Okay, now you pick the template, I'm sure you how to edit the template. And each day was just one micro task. They go in there and do the thing. So right now, we're, for ClickFunnels 2.0, we don't have either of those sequences in there, because you know how dumb we are. And so uh, I filmed the new t-shirt version uh, last week, which will be going live here in a little bit. And then um, we're bringing back our One Funnel Away Challenge as a consumption sequence. When somebody comes in to ClickFunnels, everybody will go through the One Funnel Away sequence. It'll be 30 days, all built to teach one principle and have them do that principle in software over 30 days to get them consumed. So those mm. of all things, those are the two things that had the biggest impact for us. So right. good. Yeah. So good. No good stuff. Give it up for Russell. That was really good. <laughs> Thank you. Andrew. One hundred percent. So, uh, I mean, you're in the thick of things. Where do you see the internet as overall in three years? Three years. Um, it's a good question. Um, I'm excited for most of it. Some people are gonna be crazy, but what I'm excited for is right now the world we live in. We ought to be really, really good copywriters and things like that because we're guessing, right? I got to write a sales page. Uh, it's like an event. If I speak in an event, I know I got 5,000 people in a room, I'm selling a package. I'm going to create the best possible offer that I think is going to address as many concerns as possible, motivate people, and that's what we're hoping for, right? Um, what the f what, what's coming super rapidly, AI, there's a million use cases for AI, but the thing that makes me most excited is just uh, customization based on the AI. So what we're working on now with ClickFunnels is making, is in, we're not far from, from it being like a legitimate thing that we'll all be able to start using, is instead of just coming to a page and trying to get 3 or 4% conversion, tweaking a headline, like we know all the data about someone, especially if they've bought something from the past in your ClickFunnels account. We know who they are, where they live, how much money they make. We know uh, their social profiles. Like we have all the data on somebody, right? Um, and so when somebody comes in, instead of just like having a static headline, in real time, it'll be, someone will click on a link and you know, oh, that person's from Tampa, Florida. They make $350,000 a year and whatever. So the AI will be smart to say like, hey, show the headline that's most likely to convert someone who's from Tampa, Florida, make $150,000 a year and write the headline for that person, right? And then write headline, pictures, images, and it'll re like rendering out pages in real time based on who the person is. So instead of just like hoping to convert the best we can, it's like knowing as much as we can about the person. And so the more customers you have in your platform, the more they buy from you, more like, like now I'll know, hey, if Myron's bought dot com secrets, expert secrets, not traffic secrets from me, I know that'd be great upsell or great cross or exit pop or whatever. And we can build things on the fly as people are coming in. And that's, that's what I think the future is, it's just it's no longer static anything. It's all based on the more, the more data we get on customer profiles. In fact, some of you guys probably seen I'm launching, um, well, I have, a, I have a company I'm launching with like five ulterior motives, but one of them is this. So it's, it's a personality, how many of you guys have ever seen, um, have taken a personality profile before? If you know someone's personality profile, it's really easy to sell them, right? Because you know like mostly everything about them. So we created software called understand.me, which is really cool, uh, which basically you go in there and you take all the personality profiles and then it creates one page. So you can go like, understand.me slash Russell Brunson. You guys can see my disk profile, my Enneagram, my Myers-Briggs, like all my, so all my tests are there so you can see them really quickly. Um, but what's cool that we're gonna be releasing to ClickFunnels world in the future is um, that data. So like when somebody comes in and they opt into your funnel and it pings back, say, like, oh, this person's a INFJ, they're high D, high I, and they're Enneagram three, wing, whatever, right? Write a headline for that person. And all of a sudden you're like, based on their profiles, like everything's rendered out in real time. So the, that's what that's I think the future great, is in the next, the next three years. Very great. Yeah. Steven, and then we, we got to call it a night. I got to get Russell some rest. <laughs> The biggest thing I think that people understand is it's not so much that, um, like, when, like when am I giving so much value and it changes the pricing? It's not, it's not so much that as much as like the delivery of the things what changes the pricing, right? Like when I wrote my dot com secrets book, I wasn't trying to say like, how much value am I going to give before I give more. I was, I'm going to give all the value I have. Like, so I killed myself on that book. All the value's there. And so then 
the way I charge more is not by giving them more value, it's by changing the delivery mechanism. So I have a quote I always say, that's, um, people will spend more money for the exact same content packaged in a different way. So it's the way I'm packaging that changes the pricing tiers and levels, right? A uh, book versus the course versus a seminar versus a mastermind, they, that, that's what's shifting, you know? Like, just our coaching program, we have a 25, a 50, 150, and $250,000 level. And what we, <clears throat> like, we over deliver all levels, but there's no like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna hold this back because they're not ready for it. It's like, it's all there. It's just the delivery is what shifts the, shifts the pricing. So that's kind of how I look at it, more so like that. Yeah. So I wanna say thank y'all for coming. I hope this has been extremely beneficial. I gotta get my homeboy from Idaho back to the hotel so he can get some rest before he has to stand up and rock our worlds tomorrow. And y'all need to get some rest before your world gets rocked tomorrow if you're able to sleep <laughs> after this amazing night. I'll probably get to sleep about one o'clock in the morning. But anyway, love y'all, see y'all tomorrow. Go do great things.